Coming up, Hollywood hypocrites with Dr. Gad Sad, fake news from CBC, and big moves in the conservative leadership race. Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of The Andrew Lawton Show on True North, episode 2. And what a glorious episode we will try to make it for you. If you're tuning in for the second time, thank you for your continued loyalty over two episodes. And if you're tuning in for the first time, what took you so long? In all honesty though, thanks very much. We had a great response to the first episode, so we decided we'd do it again. And hopefully again and again as time goes on. We've got a great show planned for today. We're going to talk to Professor Gad Sad coming up in a little bit. Also, one novel way to settle legal action, and I want to get into a little bit more about some of the movement in the conservative leadership race, but we'll get to all of that as time goes on. First things first, I know I took it a little bit hard with FedEx not delivering the package that you see now on the wall behind me, the famous acoustic panels, which aren't even all that exceptional, but I like them and I wanted them. And FedEx, I <laughs> kind of, I, I don't want to say I tore into them. I, I ranted gently about FedEx in the first episode. And more than anything else I talked about, I was getting emails from people that had their own stories about FedEx. So uh, it's news you can use, as they say. But I did finally get the panels, get them put up on the wall, everything like that's looked after. So we can now go on. And there's like one little piece that I'm waiting for that you'll see on the show in a couple of weeks. I won't tell you what it is, but just one little thing that I thought would be good to have. But that one's my fault. That, that one I don't blame FedEx or anyone else for. I want to start off on this topic that is a very interesting one to me, and it's the way that the Hollywood wokeness cult has really tried to take over people's lives, and the string of stories we've seen about this in the last little while, and I'm going to talk about this with Gadsad in a few moments, but there's been three stories over the last two and a half weeks or so that have really pushed this forward. I mean, you had the Golden Globes and Ricky Gervais going with this absolutely astonishingly good monologue that took aim at Hollywood hypocrites, and then you had Michelle Williams get up, you know, half an hour later and dedicate her award to protecting abortion rights, despite the fact that Ricky Gervais has become pretty popular, more so than he was before, for saying, hey, don't talk about politics. No one cares what you think. And then you have this week a few stories where Stephen King, the author, who is not Hollywood per se, but still he's in that entertainment world, tweeted something. Well, he tweeted two things. And the, the first one is the good one. The second one is the backtrack. The first tweets that he put out, as a writer, I'm allowed to nominate in just three categories, best picture, best adapted screenplay, and best original screenplay. For me, the diversity issue, as it applies to individual actors and directors anyway, did not come up. That said, I would never consider diversity in matters of art. Only quality, it seems to me that to do otherwise would be wrong. Now he writes this, and he's entirely accurate, by the way, that considering any factors other than quality means you are sacrificing quality. There's no way about it. But he gets pounced on by the left-wing Twitter mob for this. Uh, the first response was someone who says, to imply quality and diversity are mutually exclusive tells us quite loudly you are or loudly threatened you are by the potential of a level artistic playing field in which diverse stories are exponentially more compelling, yada, yada, yada. You've got someone else that says, when films are created by people of color, they get constantly overlooked by institutions comprised of white men. There's someone else who says that the assumption that quality would suffer because of diversity is, nah, and then there's an emoji. I don't know how to articulate. But you've got all of these people saying that he's saying that stuff made by non-white males can't have good quality, where he's saying the opposite of that, which is that we shouldn't take anything other than quality into consideration, which would mean if a white person makes a movie, a black person, a cis, trans, hetero, het homosexual, bi, whatever, it doesn't matter. You should fo focus on the question, is this good? And that's a reasonable proposition. He gets pounced on, though. Then he goes back a little bit with it. So the one was posted in the morning at like 7.20 a.m. And then uh, two and a half hours later, 
he decides to come out with another one. The most important thing we can do as artists and creative people is make sure everyone has the same fair shot, regardless of sex, color, or orientation. Right now, such people are badly underrepresented, and not only in the arts. You can't win awards if you're shut out of the game. Again, there, there's nothing particularly objectionable about saying that. I agree wholeheartedly in equal opportunity. But he's saying this because he's trying to backtrack from a comment that he made thinking, oh yeah, this makes sense and this is sensible and not realizing that the Twitter mob is not a sensible enterprise. They don't care about whether something is logical or rational. And he knows that he's going to get pounced on and no one wants to live through that. No one wants to be canceled. After all, just look at Vince Vaughn, who, who the same day, there are stories about, I, what was it the same day? Yeah, I think it was the same day. Stories about him daring to do the unthinkable, which was shake the hand of the president of the United States at a sports game. It was the college football playoff national championship game in New Orleans. And for 30 seconds... For 30 seconds, Vince Vaughn, who I've always liked, by the way, talks to Donald and Melania Trump at the end of which shakes his hand and walks away. And that 30 seconds is enough to get people saying, oh, uh, you know, we can't watch Vince Vaughn's movies <laughs> anymore. And the reason this is so absurd, well, many reasons, but the primary reason this is so absurd is because people are willingly overlooking what they think Vince Vaughn's quality is as an artist. Because now he's done the unthinkable, which is normalizing Donald Trump. And then you've also got the Stephen King thing, where Stephen King dares to say, uh, you know what, I kind of think that we should focus on quality and not anything other than quality. And they capitulate, or they force him to capitulate, because their concern is <laughs> the same one they've done for Vince Vaughn, that we, we can't look at the quality of the artist anymore. We have to be intersectional about all of this. We have to find a way to take down everyone unless they toe the line on every single thing that we say. And it's just so tiresome, which is why Ricky Gervais, who, by the way, I don't love Ricky Gervais. I think he's talented. I don't love him. I'm not a fan of his. But it's why his monologue at the Golden Globes, I think, was so powerful, because he went in there and just took a flamethrower <laughs> and, and took out the entire sacred cow of this Hollywood moral grandstanding, which is exactly what the industry seems to have pivoted towards in the last little while. And it's not a new concept for celebrities to try to talk about the issues that matter to them, the causes that matter to them. This isn't new, and it's not a free speech issue. They have the right to. No one's saying they don't have the right to. The issue that I raise is the entitlement factor. Why do you think your opinion matters more than someone else's? Why does your opinion matter more than some banking CEO who speaks up and says, you know, I think we need to do whatever the case may be? Because if because the, these people decry the 1%, well, they are the 1%. And that's why it gets so infuriating to listen to them go on and on and on. I mean, Leonardo DiCaprio, who famously will take a f private jet to a climate summit. You had Joaquin Phoenix, <laughs> another one. I'm, I'm actually going to play the Joaquin Phoenix clip because I, I think this is important for you to hear exactly what we're dealing with here. I struggle so much with what I can do at times. There are things that I can't avoid. I flew a plane out here today, uh, or last night rather, um, but one thing that I can do is, is change my, my eating habits. And so I just want to urge all of you to, to join me in, in that and you as well, Jay. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Yeah, so Joaquin Phoenix, who decides to do his part by ordering the vegetarian meal on his flights to talk about climate. That's how he fights climate change. I, and it's, it's laughable, but also there are people who take these things seriously. Even if most people in our circles, people on the right anyway, roll the rise at it, these folks do have influence. And you can't just totally roll your eyes because you have to understand why we are where we are. And I want to talk about that a little bit with Gad Sad. And, and the reason for that is because a lot of this you can trace back to academia. You can trace back to the academy. You can trace back to the trends that you saw in the 80s and, and continuing in the 90s in universities, which have now permeated through all these areas of society. 
And also, hopefully, we'll talk about a way to perhaps find a bit of a solution to this. Joining me on the line now is the Gad father himself, host of The Sad Truth, Professor Gad Sad. Good to talk to you. Thanks for coming on today. Oh, my pleasure. Nice to see you again, Andrew. So let's talk about this Hollywood wokeness, which started with the Golden Globes, but has actually... I think, carried a, a fair bit. I mean, a few stories that I mentioned, Vince Vaughn now getting cancelled in real time for daring to shake Trump's hand. You have Stephen King uh, making a comment that I thought was very sage and, the, and then kind of backtracking. Uh, why is the Hollywood wokeness discussion coming to a head right now? Well, because they suffer from all the idea pathogens that I discuss in my forthcoming book, one of which is a, a commitment to the DIE religion. DIE, the acronym is Diversity, Inclusion and Equity. And so they, of course, conflate equality of opportunities with equality of outcomes. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking now about the Stephen King case, uh, where he was perfectly correct in saying, look, you should not be using diversity metrics in judging art. Of course, he then backtracked. But more importantly, his original message did not go far enough. You shouldn't be using diversity metrics, not only in art, in anything that involves excellence, right? What makes us a great society is that we abide by an ethos of a meritocracy, right? Academia is now completely infested with this kind of diversity stuff. You no longer give professors uh, titles or chaired professorships or academic awards based on their achievements, by, but by whether they abide or adhere to certain uh, you know, diversity metrics. It's grotesque. Yeah, and you actually raise a valid point there about how this has really permeated through all sectors. I think a lot of these Hollywood people would love to take over corporate boards and academia and their kids' school boards with diversity and inclusion and equity, but would be very resistant if anyone were to come into their movies and say, oh, no, you need to have these quotas and everything. So typically it seems like their formula is diversity in every sector but their own. Well, that's that's the classic, you know, pathological hypocrisy that many of these ideologues suffer from, right? Uh, I'm going to talk down on, to you about the importance of you being green, and I'll do so while driving my private jet, right? Uh, and So it's grotesque. And this is, oftentimes people say, well, why do, why do I get so worked up about these issues? Because I, I despise hypocrisy. I despise intellectual dishonesty. And so I go after all of these schmucks. Yeah, Joaquin Phoenix a couple of weeks ago, or it might have been a week ago, was speaking at some climate march, and he acknowledged in the speech, you know, there are some things I, I can't avoid. Like, I had to fly here, uh, but you know what? I, I live without meat every now and then, so I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm on the front lines of this. And, and you're right. I mean, the hypocrisy is always the worst part about this. And, and this is why I thought Ricky Gervais's monologue at the Golden Globes landed so well, because he was really lighting a fire that I think needed to be lit for from within and, and hasn't really been in recent years. I agree. I mean, some, some of your viewers might be interested in a recent uh, article that I wrote in Psychology Today where I discussed why I thought Ricky Gervais's, uh, uh, you know, performance, if you'd like, or speeches uh, were so psychologically satisfy satisfying because to, to most of us, we don't take well to having these astonishingly privileged people who otherwise, as Ricky Gervais exactly said, know very little about the issues that they're pontificating about, about are constantly talking down to us, right? So because you play a, a, a hero doctor in a movie doesn't mean that you know anything about the epidemiology of diseases. You pretend to know something, right? But because they're constantly, their egos are stroked as though they are genuine heroes, they start taking themselves seriously. Know what you know and know what you don't know. Yeah, you actually made a, a very interesting point in that article, and, and you had said that the human brain didn't really evolve with the idea of cinema, and that when someone meets someone who played a superhero, their brain in some ways processes them as the superhero instead of a guy who pretended to be that character. It, it, exactly right. And I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll push that example a bit further. The reason why we become so emotionally attached to, say, a sitcom character that we let into our bedroom or our living room every week is precisely for the same evolutionary reason, right? We, our brains did not evolve knowing that we would be interacting with these fictional characters in sitcoms. So they somehow become part of our inner circle. They become sort of 
there are friends, even though it's make-believe world, but my emotional system will respond to these sitcom characters as though they're part of my family and I become vested in them. Same principle. So let me ask you then where it goes from here, because this idea of real-time cancellation of these people is a problem they have to contend with. Stephen King comes out of the gate, makes a fair comment, and then starts to backtrack with that other tweet of saying, no, 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 I believe that all of these different groups are underrepresented. And I mean, the remedy to that is exactly what he claimed, you know, three minutes earlier was the problem is that, okay, if they're underrepresented, then you have to start putting in all of these quotas that are artificial in nature. And then Vince Vaughn as well. You've got people People that are saying to him, not just, you know, I'm not a fan of Trump and, and I wonder, you know, why you would shake his hand, which I think is weird enough. But people saying, oh, it's a shame. I, I've always loved him, but now I can't watch him anymore. Why? It, he, he, you like him. <laughs> you like his work. Just because he shook someone's hand, you now say, oh, he's toxic. We can't do this. Uh, I mean, the, the way that we're going to resolve this is by the silent majority, most of whom detest the stuff, actually having the the testicular fortitude, if I may say, to actually speak out against this, right? It, it won't take much for people to rise up against this nonsense, but it really is a domino effect. The problem is, and as I discuss in my forthcoming book, case, right? Everybody diffuses the responsibility. You know, let Gad Sad put his neck out and hopefully he's got the courage to lead the fight for the rest of us. No, God Saad is one small voice in a big jungle of, of BS. So if everybody were to uh, assume the responsibility of fighting against these pathogenic ideas, then we could quickly reverse the trend. If not, I fear that the worst is yet to come. Yeah, you're right about that. Everyone wants someone else to lay the groundwork and roll out the carpet and the red carpet since we're talking about Hollywood. So now that when someone goes up and does the shtick that Ricky Gervais did, it's not nearly as courageous or bold because now he's basically carved out this little hole that anyone else can walk in. It's like walking in someone else's footsteps in the snow because you didn't want to get your ankles cold. And I fear that well, in some respects, it's fine if more people are doing it, but you're right. Everyone's waiting for someone else to take the lead on this, and the other side is sparing no effort in trying to push back the other way. Exactly, and, and one of the things that I often get is people writing to me saying, yeah, but you know, you have a large platform. You know, you're a professor, so people listen to you, and my answer to them is, look, this is an ideological battle. It's a, it's a battle for the soul of our society, so it's trench ideological warfare. Even if you're interacting with one of your friends on Facebook, where only a few people are going to hear you, speak out, challenge them politely when they say something that you think is contrary to your values. In other words, it doesn't have to be that you have a gigantic platform a la Ricky Gervais before you should be, uh, you should feel compelled to speak. It's door to door ideological warfare. So however small your voice is, it is big enough to affect some change. So participate in the battle of ideas. You know full well that a lot of what we see now in the mainstream culture really started in academia. And I think a lot of people outside of the academy didn't really take it seriously because, oh, it's just this thing that's happening in the universities. A lot of the political correctness trends that we see. And now we look at this situation where the academy has pushed even further. We've all seen the reports of, you know, the number of professors that identify as Marxists, the number of now students that identify as Marxists and are resistant to capitalism, resistant to free speech and, and all of this stuff. Do you think the solution has to come from within the academy, too? Uh, I mean, I do, because, as you said, the ecosystem from which these idea pathogens originally came from, patient zero, so to speak, is really academia. So uh, unfortunately, I, what, I, what I think ends up happening is that most academics are busy with their daily lives, right? I, I don't, yes, I know that over there somewhere in the humanities or the social sciences, they're saying some crazy things about postmodernism, that there's no objective truth, but I'm busy in my, la in my lab. I don't have time to worry about these things. So it goes back to what we discussed earlier, diffusion of responsibility. Uh, someone says, let God sad, let someone else worry about this problem. I'm busy. And therefore, my, my selfish careerist pursuits take over the greater responsibility of protecting truth. So once academics 
decide that this is a sufficiently important problem for them to address, as a few academics have done, but too few, then I think we could reverse the trend very, very quickly. Because again, as someone who has a pretty large platform, I could tell you that most of the messages that I receive are precisely ones that despise this stuff, but people are afraid to speak out. So I receive endless messages from students, from faculty members, from university staff who say, I support that, but please, please don't mention my name. Once they lose that last part, please, please don't mention my name, then we will solve the problem. One of the things that I, I see from a lot of people on, on the right in these issues is the desire to really implement parallel ecosystems. You know, if you have an issue with public schools, uh, go to private schools. If you have an issue with the big tech companies, start your own tech platforms that are conservative friendly. If you have an issue with universities, focus on these private ones. You don't like Hollywood, make conservative movies that kind of operate in this own sphere. And, and I understand that temptation, but I, I also feel there's a problem in that, in that it means you're giving up on some of the broader cultural fights that are taking place. Actually, you're giving up on all of them because right. you're saying, all right, we can't win on their turf. Let's go play with ourselves at the kids' table. I completely agree. Uh, look, it is absolutely true that uh, uh, people can set up their own uh, you know, equivalent to YouTube, and, and people have tried to do that. But the reality is that YouTube now has much of the traction, much of the traffic, and so it is easy and facile to say, hey, set up your alternative medium. Yes, of course you can do that. But the reality is, as you exactly said, no, I want to fight you on YouTube and on Facebook and in the university halls. I am a defender of truth. That's what I committed to doing when I became a professor. And therefore, no, I don't need to allow you to espouse all of these ridiculous things in the university. No, I'm going to fight you on them. And I wish more people would take up the, the battle cry. So bringing it back to the Hollywood factor then, uh, Gad, do you think that, or how, how do you think people should respond to this? Because I, I think that part of the puzzle is when a Ricky Gervais comes out and says something good to, to reward that, basically, to say, yes, there are people calling for your head, but I can assure you there are more of us that are going to support you, support your right to do this. But beyond that, where do you think we need to go to push back against this right. this uh, die nonsense, as you call well, it? Well, I mean, in the most, uh, in the clearest, most direct way, you can do it by engaging in consumer choices that let lets the the producers of these movie, movies know that you don't support this kind of stuff right uh what makes literature art cinema so beautiful is that it speaks to certain universal themes right i mean i could listen to an ancient greek poem and read it today that was written 2500 years ago and it moves me because the software of the that's in the mind of the person who created that poem is exactly the same software that my brain runs on, right? That's mm. what makes art so beautiful. And so you don't need an indigenous, Muslim, quadriplegic, transgender person to tell a story. If, if there's a good story that that person has to tell, by all means, allow it to be told. But I don't need to be moved according to identity markers. I'm moved by our common humanity. And so the way that you could fight back against this stuff is if you see that these movies are no longer about art, no longer about celebrating our humanity, logical BS, don't see that movie. And ev eventually the market will take care of this idiocy. Yeah, it certainly will, and and I'd say not soon enough, but at the same time, there are a lot of people that just begrudgingly go along with this because, as you mentioned earlier, they don't know that they have a power. I mean, a lot of the times, if you look at people that have resisted, the platform comes from standing up for it. The platform comes from taking that first step. It's not that they waited until they had it and then said, okay, now I can talk about all of these things. Yeah. Look, this is going to sound a bit cliche, but you know, when I open my laptop, the first time that I'm going to strike the first letter of my next book, the journey seems very far, right? I open a Word, a Word document and there's not a single letter written. And then one letter after one letter, one syllable after one syllable, one sentence after another, one paragraph after another, I wake up a year, a year and a half later and I have a book ready. So it takes that first step. Everybody has to do that first step. It seems, it seems gargantuan. It seems as though it's an intractable problem, but it isn't. The Berlin Wall did fall. Right. And it fell very quickly. And so these idiotic ideas that are uh, truly lobotomizing us, uh, certainly in academia, 
could be defeated, but people have to take that first step. Professor Gad Saad joining me on the line, host of The Sad Truth and all around prolific tweeter and commentator on all things crazy in the culture in which we live. Gad, thanks so much for coming on. Good to talk to you again. Likewise. My pleasure. Cheers. We are back. This is The Andrew Lawton Show on True North. Thanks for sticking with me through that. That was a fun interview to start the first week of the show for sure. Let's talk a little bit about CBC which I genuinely try to avoid doing. But in this case, I think it's very relevant. CBC has admitted to having a bit of egg on its face in response to a story they published that just wasn't entirely accurate. And the story was about Stephen Harper and comments that Stephen Harper had supposedly made about Iran. And if you saw the headline, it was that... They were saying Stephen Harper was calling for regime change in Iran. That was what Stephen Harper was pushing for. And regime change has a lot of baggage to it. It's a pretty loaded term because it's the type of term that people associate with the Iraq war, which is still contentious and people are, I think, more and more souring on it as time goes on. So they accused Stephen Harper of, well, he was doing a speech in India, pushing for regime change, which sounds like he is out there just basically trying to nation build as a one man operation. Now, in actuality, that wasn't what he was talking about. What he was speaking about was how we cannot expect to see any substantive change or stability in Iran without a change more broadly. And this is something that is very problematic, to use the word that the left loves these days, because it is really trying to put Stephen Harper into that neocon bubble that they know people are going to respond to without even reading the story. And, and that is precisely the problem with all of this. And, and if you look, for example, at the original headline, Harper says regime change needed in Iran to bring peace to region. Now, Stephen Harper posted on Twitter his own comments without any commentary. He didn't even mention a word in the tweet. He just posted the full context and what he said, no one could really take issue with. I, I don't think any of us believe that Iran would have deliberately shot down an aircraft, but the very fact that Iran believing such a thing could happen would be allowing normal civilian traffic, I think, tells you something about the nature of that regime and its priorities. And I, you know, I do believe we need to see a change in Iran if we are going to see peace in the Middle East. I see an increasing number of states in the region, um, Israel that I'm, I'm close to, the, certainly the Sunni Arab uh, monarchies, others who are increasingly trying to work together and see a common future and common interests. And you have this one actor that, quite frankly, is, uh, you know, based on religious fanaticism and regional imperialism and, and as I say, as a friend of the Jewish people, frankly, an anti-Semitic state. And I think if somehow, if there's is there any way through the protests in Iran or the consequences of this that Iran could go on a better trajectory, I think that would be very core to resolving the problems of the Middle East, certainly not resolve them all overnight. But I think without a, a change in the nature of the government of Tehran, the Middle East will continue to be in turmoil. So you hear in that he's talking about the fact that, yeah, you need change in the region for more stability. You've got to ask questions of Iran in all of this. And CBC had actually walked it back. They said the headline and lead paragraph of this story have been edited from a previous version that stated Stephen Harper said regime change was needed in Iran. A previous tweet with that headline has been deleted. In fact, Harper said, I do believe we need to see a change in Iran if we are going to see peace in the Middle East. I think without change, the nature of the government will continue to be in turmoil. And they admit in tweet three of three, he did not use regime change specifically. Uh, <laughs> I liked Ian Brody, who is a former chief of staff to Stephen Harper. He says they, they say edited when they should say corrected. They're not really admitting wrongdoing. They're just saying, yes, we've just made a little change in this. Like, you know, if the comma was in the wrong place is, is basically what they're doing. But hey, baby steps in all of this. It's, it's so important because we see the media bias problem in Canada. A lot of the time it isn't as overt as the media saying conservatives bad, liberals good. Although, I mean, CBC is suing the Conservative Party of Canada, so 
take from that what you will. But it's a lot. It's often more insidious than that. You see it in little ways that they're framing stories, like, for example, this story with Stephen Harper commenting on Iran. Because Stephen Harper has always been very good about staying in his lane as a former prime minister. He, he's always been very solid in not trying to be an armchair critic of the current guy. He said, yep, I had my time, now I've moved away. And, and there have been very few occasions when he has spoken out to condemn something that's happening. And typically it's with stuff to do with foreign policy. The Omar Khadr uh, $10.5 million payout was a, a big example where he said this is just unconscionable and it means that when he does speak out there's a lot more weight and heft to it but in this particular case he said nothing controversial and cbc decides they're going to extrapolate from it and rebrand it in something they know is going to get ragged on by people and the, people let them get away with this a lot of the time i mean what's that old quote that a lie has you know traveled all the way around the world while the truth is still putting its pants on or, or something to that effect and it's certainly with the media. So you look at their apology tweet, or whatever you want to call it. The tweet has 39 retweets and 50 likes. The original one had significantly more. The original one had gone fairly viral. Now, it was starting to get a bit ratioed. People were responding to, say, he didn't actually say this. But nevertheless, it was the original that had a lot more traveling than the correction did. More people see that than we'll see them saying, oh, maybe we begged off. And it's the same with newspapers. The corrections are, you know, buried, you know, underneath an ad and like page 12 or something. Well, the original headline that might have warranted the correction everyone saw. And the problem with all of this is that you've got a government now in Justin Trudeau, who is hell-bent on appeasing and bankrolling CBC. You've got CBC that is trying to really put its tentacles into more areas in Canadian media. They want to start becoming this, I don't even know the name of it, but this funder of local media enterprises or perhaps just take over in, in individual markets. And a Canada that is so reliant on state media is a Canada that does not have an accurate, honest voice on these things. And that's the painfully fundamental reality here, is that if state media becomes the only game in town, which is what CBC would like, you can't trust it because they are effectively forced to comment on the people that sign their checks. And my goodness, this is now going to be $1.3 billion. The mandate letter that Trudeau gave the Heritage Minister calls for even more CBC funding. And on it goes. I mean, give it a decade and we're probably going to be giving them $2 billion a year, if not more. And they're going to be saying that they still need to expand into all of these different areas. And no one, no one seems prepared to rethink CBC. No one in the conservative movement, no one in the conservative party, let me clarify, no one in the conservative party seems prepared to do something about this. In the 2017 conservative leadership race, Andrew Scheer had made a, a comment, a tacit comment about, you know, maybe CBC doesn't need to be in the news division uh, because that's an area where everyone else is, you know, competing adequately. And this was taken by iPolitics, who ran a big story about it. But there wasn't really a, a policy there. He wasn't really announcing anything. He was, I think, responding to a question and said, eh, maybe, maybe this is worth doing. I would love to see a conservative leadership candidate as we head into the leadership race, say... Uh, defund CBC or sell off CBC or something like that just to get that discussion going, just to get the discussion going. Because right now, no one is prepared to deal with this thing, which is not only a, a fiscal a balloon that's hanging up in the sky, just there, money that's wasted that's not going to anything else, but has significant implications for trust in media as well. And that is, I think, going to be a big problem moving forward. And I would love to see some leadership in someone prepared to take that on. I try not to have things be so heavy all the time. So I've got a fun story for you from the Associated Press, uh, where I, I go a little bit outside of Canada for this one, but bear with me because I think it's kind of fun. A Kansas man has asked an Iowa judge 
to let him engage in a sword fight with his ex-wife embracing trial by combat. So he's very unhappy with this protracted litigation. And if you've ever seen the justice system's pace, you'd understand why. So he wants trial by combat where he and his ex-wife will be able to, quote, rend their souls from their bodies, unquote. I mean, who among us hasn't wanted that at some point in the day? And ultimately, he needs a 12-week extension uh, for the reason that we all need extensions in court so he can procure Japanese samurai swords for the trial. So trial by combat. <laughs> His rationale is actually pretty sound. He says U.S. law doesn't specifically prohibit it, and because it doesn't specifically prohibit it, therefore it should be fine. Now, presumably trial by combat would require someone else to agree to it. I don't know if that is uh, something the ex-wife is game for. Uh, he was very generous, though, very magnanimous, actually. He said that uh, if she wants, she can appoint someone else to serve as her champion in the battle. He suggested her his ex-wife's lawyer, uh, which... <laughs> In that, in that case, I think people might be rooting for uh, the guy, uh, rooting for the husband, not for the uh, the lawyer. But you never know. Trial by combat coming soon to a, a Kansas courtroom near you. Uh, this one's also a fun one. Students outraged as U of T professor makes students follow him on social media for grades. Now, this I find just bizarre for many, many reasons. A professor that will set aside 5% of the students' grades for one, buying his book, two, getting him to sign the book, three, four, five, following him on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. So if you just do LinkedIn and Twitter and not Facebook and you get the book but don't get it signed, you get 3% on your uh, grade, otherwise you get nothing. And this was something that a student actually complained about on Reddit. And the professor says that students are able to learn from him and the things that he posts. He said, I would say there's not much for me to profit from as far as the books. But then he said that students have benefited from being connected and making use of his networks. Uh, he said that, uh, uh, you know, most people are okay with this. His students all think it's fine and dandy. And here we go. Like, I didn't know this was an option to boost my Twitter following. I could just take, like, a guest lecturer position at, you know, the University of Western Ontario and say, all right, 25% of your grades following me on Twitter, listening to the podcast, subscribing on iTunes, which, by the way, subscribe on iTunes. You get no credit for it, but I'm happy with you, which I guess is some form of credit. I don't know. Well, trial by combat if you don't want to subscribe. <laughs> but this is now something that uh, he has said he'll continue he said it is part of the course because he is a social media guy. So this is what happens in millennial academia. I should have asked Gad Sad about that one too. <laughs> uh, we've got to take a quick break. We'll close things out on the Andrew Lawton Show when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everyone, to The Andrew Lawton Show. I said from the outset of the program it wasn't going to be all conservative leadership all the time, but you also can't exactly gloss over the biggest Canadian political news stories as they develop, and it is a bit of a horse race right now. And a few updates this week. Uh, more movement than I anticipated, well, not anticipated, but than I knew about during the first episode. The big three are that Rana Ambrose is out of the race, according to initially a report in La Press that was then picked up by the English language press. Peter McKay is in, at least he's going to be in. We'll talk about his announcement in a moment. And the big one is that Stephen Harper seems to be dedicating his time to blocking Jean Charest, who hasn't officially announced, but it sounds like is organizing very largely and significantly behind the scenes. So these are three big movements. It's not like, oh, that guy who was the staffer to Kim Campbell is running It's uh, or not running anymore. These are bigger movements here. I want to talk about all three, but specifically Ronna Ambrose to start, because this is, I think, the one that everyone assumed would happen from the outset, and I, I didn't see her running. So I wasn't going to bet everything I owned on it, but I didn't see her running for a couple of reasons. And one of them is that 
I think a lot of Ronna Ambrose's appeal has been that forbidden fruit syndrome. People wanted her because they couldn't have her. This is why she was chosen by the caucus to be the interim leader after Stephen Harper left, because she was non-threatening in the sense that she wasn't going to be running for the permanent leadership, and she was very candid about that. So by her taking on that role very capably, I might add. I think she was a tremendously successful leader of the opposition. She was very good at being a steady hand and and keeping the party on its course. She did that because she was unifying and inoffensive to the party. So the idea of her jumping into a race where she has to start scrapping to get airtime, to get votes, to get money, to get all of these things, which is how you have to run a leadership, was never the strength that she brought to the table. So I don't necessarily think that she was the shoe-in that people thought. I mean, I think she's very similar to Lisa Raitt, who in 2017, and I like Lisa a lot, did not do well in the leadership, but at the same time, she was also very popular and liked as a deputy leader. Some people are liked in certain roles, and in others, it's not necessarily a guarantee. And I had a conversation with someone a while back, maybe three or four weeks ago, who had said that basically their belief, and I think they were kind of indicating that Ronna understood this, was that everyone likes her when she's not in. The second she gets in the race, she's, oh, this former Harvard cabinet minister and all of these different things. So that's a big problem because the media loves to do this. They love to say, oh, why can't all conservatives be like X? And then once X gets into the race, they become the new Hitler. Uh, in Ontario, this happened to Christine Elliott. Everyone said, oh my goodness, why couldn't why couldn't Christine Elliott be the leader? But they still hate her. Once she runs and she's in government, everyone hates her. Uh, they all, I mean, if Michael Chong were to be the leader of the Conservatives, and I hope that doesn't happen, the media would turn on him and think he's the latest and most furthest right thing that has ever happened since sliced bread. No, uh, sliced bread. Actually, sliced uh, bread had some very offensive tweets back in the day. So sliced bread has been canceled now. He's far right. But my goodness. So I think Ronna Ambrose is very valuable. I would love to see her return to politics at some time. She's out, and I think she's enjoying her post-political life a fair bit and, and is staying put there. Peter McKay is interesting because I did not anticipate, when would it have been a year ago that I saw him, that he would ever jump back into politics. Now, Peter McKay is a guy who was the defense minister. He was the uh, attorney general. He was uh, at one point trying to be the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, or wanted to be. And Peter McKay, I saw him at an event in Toronto about a year ago, maybe a little bit more. And his wife, Nazneen Afshin Jam, the human rights activist, was speaking. And Peter McKay was at the back of the room and he was pushing a stroller and he had uh, one of those reverse backpacks on that you put a child into. And then he had another backpack on his back for the gear for the children. And the stroller was a double. So he had his three kids there and he was wearing his glasses and this little like crew neck dad sweater. And I saw him and we're chatting very briefly. And I thought to myself, this is a man who is completely satisfied with life after politics. He had literally turned himself into a human minivan for his kids and all their stuff. And things change. (laughs) Things change because a year and however many months later, uh, he is in the race. Uh, Very anticlimactic announcement, though. If you saw it, he tweeted... Uh, let, I'll pull up the exact wording. I think it was it was four words, so I, I can't get the four words wrong uh, because there are so few of them. I'm in. Stay tuned. And because it's Canada, he, of course, tweeted it in both official languages. So he's in. Stay tuned. <laughs> we were like, woo. So there's no like grand video or website or speech or anything like that. Just a tweet. And he's apparently, according to the media reports, going to be formally announcing next week. Now, Peter McKay is going to become the Red Tory poster boy. He was testing the waters, you could tell, uh, before Andrew Scheer even left by firing a couple of pot shots at Andrew Scheer, like miss scoring on an open net. That was the one line he gave in that panel. And you could tell that he was greasing the skids for eventually jumping in and saying, all right, here I am. But I think he overestimates his popularity quite significantly. I I think that Peter McKay 
will sweep Atlantic Canada. The Conservative Party of Canada rules do not really give much weighting overall to Atlantic Canada. Every riding has 100 points, and there are only so many Atlantic ridings. I think there are like 20, 27 or 28 total. And that's that. I mean, he'll probably do well in parts of Ontario, but I don't think that a red Tory is going to be the way the party goes. And so, and if they do, I don't think it will be Peter McKay. What I do find interesting is that there must be some people a little bit nervous about Jean Charest. And the reason for that is that Stephen Harper resigned from the Conservative Fund. Now, initially, this was a McLean story from Paul Wells. When it came out, it looked as though Stephen Harper was resigning in protest for how the Conservative Fund handled the Andrew Scheer private school tuition top-up thing that came out a few weeks ago. But then the story evolved a little bit, and I, I'm going to read a section from this here. Two top conservative sources have told McLean's that Harper's main goal in resigning is to free himself up to block Jean Charest's campaign for the party leadership. Charest uh, goes on and talks about how uh, Harper and Charest were close, but they had a falling out back in 2007. And now Stephen Harper is apparently wanting to devote his time to blocking this guy. Now, Stephen Harper, who's always been, and I mentioned this earlier, pretty good at staying out of the fray. Stephen Harper getting involved in this way in a party street fight means he must hate the idea of a Sheree leadership. Now, I hate the idea of a Sheree leadership based on what I've seen so far. I think uh, it's like remaking Marvel movies because you don't have any new ideas. It's that we already had this guy. And I think I might have said that on the first episode. It's great. I'm already running out of material and it's the, uh, the second episode. But the thing that, about Stephen Harper is that if he were to get into the conservative leadership race right now, and I, I, I'm not saying he is, but if he were to do that, he would be a shoe in because Stephen Harper is still very much the spiritual leader, if you will, of the Conservative Party of Canada. It's his party. Everyone compares everyone to him. The critics compare and the people that like the CPC compare. So if he were to come out and say, this is the person we're, we're backing, I'm pretty sure that person would win. Because Stephen Harper is the guy the conservatives hold as the as the benchmark. And, and he set a very high standard that's difficult for subsequent leaders to meet. But if he says no, and he says, I'm fighting, people are, are not going to turn well to that. I think, you know, whether Charest had a chance in the first place, I'm not convinced he did. But this will certainly give him no love at all from people in the party that are anything right of... Michael Chong. I mean, I mean, this is a guy who, whose most relevant political service was as a liberal. And it was as a Quebec liberal, yes, which is a bit different from a federal liberal. But that's how he's known. That's how he made his mark. And more importantly, he's done. End of scene. You, you don't get to do an encore when you're not... I, who does encores? Bob Dylan or Elton John. Like, you don't get to do an encore when people aren't, you know, standing up and cheering and yelling for it. No one. No one in Canada is standing up and cheering and yelling for Jean Charest to get back into the stage except for Jean Charest, and that's incredibly important. Now, Stephen Harper, people would take an encore from him. People would take an encore from Stephen Harper. They are not wanting one from Jean Charest. So this is the big movement this week in the conservative leadership race. Like I said, we'll talk to all the candidates. We'll get them all on the show if they'll come. But this is going to be a very interesting race if it becomes, especially if Stephen Harper is not backing his former attorney general and defense minister. And I don't think he will. Uh, given, I mean, it sounds like he might not even be backing anyone, but certainly to do the anti-endorsement, which is what he's doing with Jean Charest. That's all we have for today. My thanks to everyone who listened to the program, to Gadsad for coming on, and please do subscribe. You can head on over to andrewlawtonshow.com, and all the links are there to subscribe on iTunes or Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Omni, uh, carrier pigeons, I believe we've just added this week. So all the things you need are right there. We'll talk to you next time, folks. Thank you. God bless and good day.